My name is Akash. Uh, I am a UC Berkeley student still, finishing up my last year. Uh, I used to work at Interstellar, and now I'm working on some Interledger research. Um, I have my very talented panelists here. Uh, we have Evan from Interledger and Ripple, and we have Nate Rush, for, who is a who's an undergrad. Uh, he's at UPenn, and he did research at Ethereum. We have Dan Robinson from Chain, uh, which is now Interstellar. And we have Mo Dong from Seller. Uh, so to start off this panel, I'd like to bring up a discussion of uh, what is exactly uh, layer one and what exactly is layer two. So uh, panelists, please chime in. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll jump for it. Uh, can you guys hear me? All good? No? Louder? OK, cool. Um, yeah, so uh, I think it might be cool to just talk about like what our goals are in terms of scalability before we go into the layer one, layer two stuff. Um, obviously, scalability means increases in capacity in some sense. Um, and I think uh, like one theme throughout this talk uh, that we'll probably hit on a lot is, especially when talking about layer one, layer two, is um, essentially what assumptions are required to give us these increases in capacity um, and kind of under what assumptions are things secure um, and decentralized. Um, uh, as a side note, when I say increases in capacity, like personally, when I'm talking about scalability, I guess what I'm talking about is the classic one, transactions per second, but also in terms of uh, state size. And you can kind of think about that as like, you know, how many things can we have, uh, you know, stored on the blockchain at once? Um, yeah. So just to, I guess, start the combo. I'll, I'll jump in and this one. Can All right. Um, I'll jump in and say, I, when I think of scalability, I mostly think about transaction throughput. So that's the transactions per second that people often mention, as well as latency. I think that's a really big problem. If anyone has ever actually tried to use a blockchain, that's quite a painful experience in many cases. So I think there's an element of, can we speed this up and make it just more usable in that way? So I, one thing I do think we'll all agree on, maybe, or we can fight about it, is um, when we talk about layer one scaling, um, hello? Yeah. If we, if we talk about layer one scaling, um, we're not just talking, uh, or, or, here, or nobody here would argue that all we need to do is just sort of increase the block size or increase the size of the data that everybody has to process. Um, because ultimately, that's, uh, that doesn't, you know, doesn't scale. And it says that, like, literally, if, if everybody has to be processing every transaction, everybody's using the blockchain has to process every transaction then you're just not going to be able to get that kind of, uh, the kind of throughput that we want while still um, uh, preserving kind of the, the trustlessness that we want, right? So, and I think Nate here is, is I think, going to be sort of the biggest skeptic of layer two scaling and most in favor of layer one scaling. But when you say layer one scaling, you're referring not just to raising the block size, but also to stuff like sharding and other, other sort of in protocol supported scaling, right? Yeah, yeah, totally. So I think uh, 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 you bring up a really interesting point in that in some ways when we say increases in capacity and like scaling, um, we kind of, there's, there's some easy ways to do it that kind of give up on what, you know, the entire goal of the space in a way. Um, for example, if we made the blocks, you know, you know, 70 gigabytes big, oh great, we'll have so many transactions per second, but at the same time, is that going to be able to run in consumer hardware? Probably not, um, depending on what you define as consumer hardware. Um, and so in some sense, we have to be careful that when we're talking about scalability, we also keep in mind that we also care about other things too, um, like decentralization, whatever that means, and uh, security as well. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm definitely going to be a proponent of uh, second layer, or first layer scaling solutions, probably. Um, and, and also, I probably won't be satisfied with them if they're just, oh, make the blocks huge and have super nodes processing everything. Um, we should probably go back to Akasha's original question of what do we mean by layer one and layer two? Um, yeah. So, um, so, yeah. Well, yeah I, can, ahead, I can maybe like uh, give a very simple classification on that. That is uh, for layer one scalability, it's like uh, uh, we are talking about the consensus. Basically, how can we make the consensus process faster and put more transactions in it? And uh, that's like the two things that we do on the layer one scaling. And but the key thing here is that it, it, al it always involves the consensus process. So. For example, uh, sharding can be considered as layer one solution, and also uh, things like new consensus algorithms, and maybe even like a, 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 you know, a little bit more centralized algorithm like DPoS can be considered as layer one solutions. Now, for layer two solution, the, the key insight here is to use uh, blockchain as a settlement layer. 
and uh, move most of the transactions uh, away from the blockchain without actually incurring this global consensus process. Because whatever the uh, consensus, uh, however fast the consensus algorithm are, the, uh, the overhead of communication delay of decentralized or distributed system is always gonna be there. So there's kind of like a ceiling on the uh, layer one uh, solutions, uh, consensus, uh, sorry, layer one solutions scalability. That's why like we're starting to investigate uh, more towards the, uh, to, to the layer, layer two solution, uh, which is like bringing the transaction off the blockchain. And for layer two solutions, uh, some of the example technologies people have been talking about, including state channels, um, uh, in the form of uh, you know, simple payment channel or in the more complex form of generalized state channels and also uh, things like side chains and also interactive computing. All these things can be classified as layer two solutions. That is like a, a use uh, the blockchain as the final settlement layer, but most of the transaction is optimistically put off chain. Okay, so, so Nate, why do you consider sharding to be a layer one rather than a layer two solution? Given that you're taking the transactions off of the blockchain that everybody has to have consensus on, you're putting them on some other blockchain, there's some process for essentially like making reconciling all of these things together. But what, how do you distinguish that sharding? Why would you still call that layer one scaling? Yeah, so um, I guess the, the, the kind of distinguisher for me is like the question of in the protocol versus out of the protocol. Um, and I, I, it kind of kicks the can a bit because like the word protocol isn't actually very well defined at all. Um, but in, in some sense, the idea is that um, the blockchain uh, has awareness of some state. Um, uh, and essentially, in sharding, even though any individual shard might not have awareness of the entire system at any given point in time, the shards as a whole kind of collectively have an awareness of you know, what's going on, if that makes sense. Um, and so we distinguish, I distinguish, r uh, uh, rather than using the word consensus, I might say it's in the protocol versus on top of the protocol. But, but so, I mean, Ripple has built-in support for payment channels. Like, that's a first-class feature. It's called payment channels in the implementation. That's built-in support for payment channels. Does that mean payment channels are a layer one scaling solution? Yeah, it's a lovely question. Um, OK, so I guess let me actually uh, change my answer a bit. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, you're getting to the heart of it. Um, so um, I would actually define, um, I think, like one kind of key distinguishing feature when we're talking about these things. As I said before, like the way we can understand them is in terms of the assumptions or the uh, properties that are required to make these things secure. Um, in some sense, layer two solutions require interactivity in some sense. Um, and one kind of key distinguishing feature about what's in protocol for me is that um, there's no interactivity required on behalf of the user. Um, so um, a real quick example of that, right? Um, for example, in the Lightning Network, uh, this is an ex example of a kind of a second layer scaling solution. Um, uh, it requires users to be online, kind of monitoring their channels at any given point in time, even if it's in protocol, to make sure that their coins aren't stolen. We can kind of get into the details of that as we go along, but I think for me, kind of one main distinguishing feature is this interactivity that's required in second layer solutions. Well, it's a, it's well a uh, to, to add on to that, aren't there also ways around sort of that interactivity aspect? Couldn't you have somebody else uh, being responsible for that interactivity? and Basically, you have you have non-interactive layer two scaling just by having like watchtowers, for example. Yeah, um, you know, someone's watching. The watchtowers are right. Even if it's not interactive necessarily on behalf of the user, someone needs to be online on their behalf, and you know, they're the user even if it's by proxy. So someone is like miners or validators, on it, right? Yeah. So in that sense, does it does does a layer two protocol become a layer one protocol? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, it's a great question. I think, uh, so here's what I'll say. Uh, in certain cases, I think the, the lines begin becoming a bit wavy. I'm sure we could design kind of some fancy layer two protocols that maybe use, oh, I don't know, zero knowledge proofs or whatever magic you want um, to kind of make things non-interactive in a way. Um, and in that case, you start getting into places where we're a lot closer probably to layer one scalability. Um, and, and I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that it's probably more of a spectrum than just there's that and that. Um, and in general, the way we can kind of analyze these things is, is under what situations do they provide good guarantees to users? Because in the end, that's all we really care about. Right, so to sort of uh, transition uh, to something more high level so that we don't get too into the weeds, um, what, are, what are some scenarios where you might find layer one, sh layer one scaling better than, uh, say, layer two scaling? And uh, would you say this is like for the majority of scenarios or uh, are there scenarios where layer two just happens to work really well? Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts. You know, this, <laughs> uh, this is a great question, but it's, it's unfortunately kind of goes back to like what is layer one, layer two scaling. Uh, so uh, I think one way to think about which, which scenario is better suitable for uh, layer one scaling or which, which scenario is better suitable for layer two is that for layer two, 
the key concept here is that it, the intermediate state doesn't matter that much, right? So for state channel, you have super high frequency interactiveness and all that stuff. But finally, when you resolve it back on chain, many of the state doesn't, uh, doesn't actually matter anymore. And for sidechain, the same thing, you create a, a, a chain that is on the side of uh, uh, your blockchain and you c keep committing the block root to the main chain. And uh, finally, when everyone is like done with the app or like uh, when, I w uh, when someone is trying to withdraw the state, it is basically you know, exiting from the sidechain. So, uh, for the, uh, so now come back to the question of like uh, which use case is more suitable for layer one, which use case is more suitable for layer two. So if you are more focusing about like letting your state pertain or letting your state be consistently available to all people involved in this blockchain, uh, uh, in this blockchain then uh, you should be looking at like a layer one solutions or you should be actually putting your transaction onto the uh, uh, you know, underlying blockchain. Uh, if it is a more interactive and uh, the state is a more transient in nature, then uh, you know, uh, you, we should be like mo looking more towards the layer two solutions. So, so like for a scenario like value transfer, uh, like what would you say is the best uh, scaling method? Um, so uh, I might actually push back a bit and just present kind of, I guess I'm gonna call it a pipe dream, uh, like a, you know, a dream of a possible future that would be really cool if we could get there. Um, in some sense, uh, we think that layer one scalability solutions can provide kind of the most robust guarantees to users. Um, but we also know that in some cases, like uh, layer two scaling solutions for example, uh, state channels or payment channels or lightning, et cetera, um, really help out on latency, as you kind of mentioned. It's an, a, kind of an important consideration. Um, and I think, for me, um, kind of one of the main goals would be we use things like second, what we call second layer scalability solutions now, really as solutions for latency, um, and more than anything else. And where we're actually doing our transactions, though, ends up being on, on first layer, just for the security reasons. What about privacy? If, uh, uh, under your definition, even of layer one scaling, right? Still, everything's happening in public, right? Yeah, yeah, fair point. Yeah, I think uh, I would I would argue that privacy is a, a separate problem that also needs to be solved. In some sense, you do get some privacy benefits from keeping you know some of the intermediate state off chain, um, but I think I think that's something that we can solve uh, on our first layers as well, you know, in protocol as well. I want to go go back to the the previous point you made, and just like I actually think it's it's important to marry both scalable layer one solutions with off with scalable layer two solutions. So um, specifically with the value transfer example, I think a lot of times we're going to see there's many repeated transactions with the same parties. Those make a lot of sense to do off chain in things like payment channels. Payment, ch payment channels are bilateral examples. There's also multilateral examples like side chains and things like that. So I think that makes a lot of sense to move a lot of those transactions off chain. At the same time, even if you're doing that for latency or transaction throughput reasons, you still want the layer one blockchain to be pretty fast and pretty cheap. Otherwise, you end up with a really bad experience for even just opening and closing these types of relationships. So if you want to move money into a payment channel and you have to wait an hour or hours to do that, this is a terrible user experience. If you, that also means that if you want to deposit more money into that or withdraw money from it, it's again that really long delay and maybe very high cost. So I see it as it's important to have both pretty fast, pretty cheap transactions on the blockchain, even if you're only using those to set up payment channels and close them down. I wonder if uh, anyone here is familiar with like the counterfactual like style of instantiating uh, uh, like payment channels and, and the likes of those because apparently you can do stuff completely off chain until like you just want to close the channel. So yeah, so we uh, we are working with uh, L4 and uh, uh, L4 uh, proposed a counterfactual project and Seller proposed a Seller, uh, which is like our C channel construct. Uh, this is two concurrent work that both enables uh, uh, what we call virtual contract, or what is L4 is calling counterfactual instantiation. So the idea is that if you're opening a state channel, if there's no state race among the state channel, like payment channel, we cannot do this. But uh, if, uh, if you're doing like a, a, a chess game that is uh, some payment is conditionally depends on, then that chess game doesn't have to have an on-chain anchor until there is a possible dispute or settlement happens. So that is kind of like the thing. Uh, you know uh, uh, it, it, that is possible. Now, uh, I, I guess like uh, just uh, just to to, uh, to have a methodology of thinking about this question. That is, uh, uh, you know, uh, how are we thinking about layer one, layer two solution? I guess one question to ask is that uh, uh, first of all, 
how uh, how much scalability do we actually need on blockchain, right? So this is like the grand question or grand challenge that we all need to think about. Is it like t uh, 20,000 transactions per second? Uh, how fast is the latency? Is it like one RTT? Uh, like, um, you know, uh, hundreds of milliseconds, tens of milliseconds, or like uh, even one second, 10 seconds is enough. So these kind of questions actually uh, print a frame uh, about like the things that we can draw inside of this frame, right? So if, uh, let's say, the conclusion is that we need, let's say, hundreds of millions of transactions per second. Then we know that uh, as a principle of decentralized system or distributed system, it, it simply cannot, uh, uh, you know, have that kind of scalability because, uh, uh, you know, for a simple decentralized system without shards, uh, it's, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the transaction processing capability is bounded by one machine. But even with shards, the Amadal law uh, dictates that as long as you have small percentage of unparalleled job, the embarrassing parallel uh, way of uh, uh, Paralyzing things uh, it kind of uh, quickly fails, and uh, like this entire scalability improvement curve flat out as uh, uh, even if you add more and more parallelization in it. So the, I guess the question for you know all of us to think about, and maybe we can discuss, is uh, what each of you guys think about like uh, uh, you know the ultimate goal of blockchain scalability is. Like where is the mass adoption goal? So I'm very focused on value transfer and payments, exchanges, things like that. And I think a lot of people like pointing to Visa's numbers as like the numbers to beat, 50,000 transactions per second. I think that is way, way lowballing it by many orders of magnitude because if what this whole space is kind of marching towards is the, <coughs> is the idea of an internet of value or something along those lines, I think what we're going to see is transa value transfers on the scale of internet packets. So. I don't actually know how many packets per second the internet processes. I'm not sure that's like a quite knowable number, but I looked at some point how it's many transactions. It's 53 terabytes per second, roughly. Which is not <laughs> that That's actually different, though, than packets per second. Um, which is, the, to me, the interesting question because we're talking about like pa packets are individual transactions. So the main point I wanted to make was just like my home router, like your, your cheap kind of home, home router can do something somewhere between 100,000 and a million packets per second. And that's just what you have at home. That's not commercial grade or anything. So when I think about packets per second, that's the way that I'm thinking about it. And then with latency, I think that's also super, super important where I think um, if you want to make transactions across the world, you want to have very real-time experiences. People notice if you start taking too long. And you know, in, in traditional value transfer in the banking system and whatnot, we're, we're used to days, which is a completely unacceptable experience. But I think if we're moving towards this internet of value idea, we want it to happen, it should happen at the speed of the physical network latency. Like when we think about payment latency and interledger, we're, we're worried about the constraints of the speed of light. At a certain point, you can't move faster than you know, the electrons going physically from me to you. But I think that's the way we should be thinking about payments, at least. Other types of transactions may be different, but that's the way I think about it. Cool. Yeah. Um, interestingly enough, I'm, I guess, less interested in payments and kind of more interested in like the, you know, the general space of decentralized applications. Again, whatever the hell that means. But uh, um, yeah, so I, I guess I'm somehow like less interested in like very specific scalability numbers or you know a specific target to aspire to rather than um, I think that our like aspirational goal really should be as scalable as of a layer one as we possibly can have right for the essentially the reasons that you lay out even if you have you know a, a lovely uh, layer two if your you know your your blockchain itself can only support 14 transactions per second not that many state channels are going to exist on it um, and so I think. Um, Reasonably, as protocol designers, our, our, our goal should be as scalable of a layer one as we can possibly make it. And then, you know, if it's still not enough, then, you know, maybe we compromise on security from there. Um, oh, you don't compromise security for layer two. Yeah, that's, that's a key thing. Um, you know, maybe we could get into it. But, uh, you know, there are additional assumptions you have to make. Right, right. Um, so you don't compromise on security under some set of assumptions, which it turns out may or may not be reasonable. Um, yeah. so, so, I mean, what... Can you describe a little how how sharding scaling works? Because because you, you're not you're, the idea here is you're saying you're not not everybody's processing every transaction, but you're still saying in some sense you're calling this layer one. Yeah, um, yeah. So uh, I guess what I are you talking about? Yeah, great. Fair point. Fair <laughs> point. Um, yeah. So I'm gonna give. I, I guess I'll attempt to give like a high level kind of summary of the the ideas behind sharding. Um, so as of now, blockchains. We got a single chain of blocks going along. Every single full node verifies all of the blocks in the blockchain. 
Um, and uh, that's pretty much how it works. Um, the idea behind charting is essentially imagine if uh, inst we had some set of people who are maintaining the network, so you can think about them in proof of work as miners or in proof of stake as validators, and we essentially shuffle them around and assign them to, to specific shards. And here when I say shards, I mean you can imagine baby blockchains in some sense. Um, how these shards are arranged is an open question. Is it a tree? Is it kind of some amorphous uh, you know, graph of shards where they can communicate? But in any sense, we have essentially autonomous blockchains advancing that share, they essentially pull their security from a global, let's call it validator set. Um, on top of that, you essentially, you need to have the ability to essentially send transactions between shards and move validators between shards. Um, uh, and, and once you have that, you pretty much what you have what I would classify as a, a first layer sharding solution. But so you, you don't do you have at any given point like a consensus as to total ordering of all transactions across all shards? Uh, definitely no. Uh, yeah, you would definitely not uh, kind of enforce a total order on all transactions across all shards because if you're doing that, we're kind of right back to where we were in the beginning with just you know one blockchain. Um, I, mean, I think maybe this is a definitional issue, but to me, like again, once once you get beyond essentially one blockchain with total ordering consensus, everybody sees all of it. We're talking about different layer two things. And like, you know, Plasma set is different from state channels, or different from side chains, different from sharding. But these are all essentially ways of making sure that you're, you, you are able to trust the security of this without you seeing everybody else's state. Yeah, no, yeah, I, I think you're right in that, the, that that goal specifically is very much the same. But uh, the differences kind of lie in, um, you know, the assumptions we make about the validator set. And like, for example, in Plasma, your validator set isn't the, glo the, the global validator set of the actual blockchain itself, right? Which is hypothetically more distributed and, you know, we've got a larger pool and we can, you know, make kind of nicer assumptions about it, I guess I'll say. Um, which is probably, in my opinion, where the, the security comes from. Um, yeah. So, Dan, I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts uh, regarding uh, sort of how Plasma compares with sharding because uh, essentially Plasma is creating these application-specific, like, uh, blockchains, and you have sharding, which is sort of taking the global state and uh, splitting it up into these child blockchains that eventually converge to one. Um, so, like, how are these ideas different? And, like, well, maybe you can elaborate more on some of the, like, uh, better side of, like, plasma versus sharding. So yeah, so anyway, I, don't, I don't want to get too far necessarily into technical details of it, but, but as sort of a... Um, the broad way I would say I would think about Plasma for those who aren't familiar with it and the difference, the way it differs from sidechains or sharding is that in Plasma, um, you have essentially a sidechain, but it's one where you don't necessarily have to depend on whatever process is producing these blocks. So you don't have to trust that there's a set of validators um, or, and that, and that you know, uh, some percentage, a uh, sufficient percentage of them are honest. Um, you can actually have a validator, an operator who's producing these Plasma blocks um, and maintaining this, this sidechain that's completely untrusted and you still preserve safety of any funds that you have on the chain. And that's not true about, uh, about, shard, about sharding or about, about sidechains, that you're essentially trusting this set of validators um, for like the layer one, for this layer one security. You basically have to trust the validators if they're malicious, then they can, you know, they can uh, potentially attack you. What, um, so the advantage that Plasma gives you then is that you can have a, a Plasma chain with like a single operator and not have to trust them. Um, so much like how in a state channel, you don't have to trust your immediate counterparty. Uh, are there like slowdowns when you implement, say, like uh, more than just like a single operator on like Plasma? Or are there like I if I decide I'm going to put like a proof of stake, uh, like BFT consensus layer on top of that, does it essentially become sharding in a sense? Yeah, and I think the the more the more you try to put into sort of like oh we're going to make sure that Plasma blocks are are produced by this distributed consensus, you might you eventually get to just basically side chains, um, where you're saying we might as well just trust that this process is producing, is producing blocks. But I think, where I think mostly sort of the, the sweet spot for plasma design is, is when you have one sensible single operator who you sort of trust for like liveness. You say, I assume they're probably gonna stay online and it might be a little inconvenient if they go offline, um, but uh, I'm not going to trust them you know, with the ability to steal all my money. So that's, yeah, so that's again where I, where I sort of see plasma fitting in. Plasma I think is, is undisputedly sort of a, a layer two solution and that it's, it's something that um, like Ned, Nate said, you're sort of depending on this interactivity, you're depending on this exit game, you're depending on some synchrony assumptions that like I'll be online once a week. Um, uh, but you're not depending, and I, I kind of like this about it, you're not depending on sort of the honesty of, of a set of validators. Another thing I was sort of wondering about was, uh, and, I, and I think uh, some of the audience might benefit from hearing this, is um, in terms of like plasma, uh, what kind of transactions would I be able to scale versus, say, like 
a, a network like Lightning or a, or a payment or a value transfer network like Interledger? Um, like, what, what kind of stuff I can can I do differently? Right. So yeah. Yeah. So plasma is kind of like an overloaded word these days. Like you have a uh, you have all sorts of flavors of plasma. You have plasma. You have plasma M uh, MVP. You have plasma XT. You have plasma cache. You have plasma. You know, I I don't even keep I I don't ca I can't even try keep track of things. But the the key idea for plasma is that uh, you know uh, it's uh, it's a sidechain construct. Okay. So but it's a sidechain construct with the capability to attribute fault to uh, you know malicious uh, block proposers. So it's it's just that it's uh, the high level idea of plasma. So you can basically, uh, if some if some um, uh, block proposer in the plasma chain is trying to produce a false block, there's a smart contract that is sitting on the Ethereum blockchain dictating what is the correct uh, rule of producing blocks. And if someone sees that he's uh, behaving maliciously, uh, you know that fisherman or whoever can just submit that fraud proof on chain and slash the plasma block proposer's uh, stake, basically. So. Uh, sorry, what was the question? What? <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so what kind of uh, what kind of uh, uh, things can be scalable on plasma chain? So, for for this kind of a sidechain construct, uh, currently the uh, the implementation is mostly oriented towards payment. Um, the uh, implementing the implementing EVM inside of a plasma is relatively hard uh, because uh, uh, you know uh, there is like a, uh, there is a problem about who owns that virtual machine state. Right, so if you have a state, you or you have a virtual machine, you have a smart contract that, that, that is running inside of a plasma, uh, you know, uh, when you're withdrawing the smart contract, you're not only, only withdrawing tokens. Uh, withdrawing tokens is relatively simple because the token has a single ownership. There's no state race, again. The state race is very key concept in, uh, in the uh, layer two construct. When you're withdrawing the smart contract, it's very hard to tell that who has the right to withdraw this smart contract? Let's put like uh, some uh, uh, you know uh, auction contract in the in, uh, on plasma, and when people are doing auction, can people like withdraw the all all the result of the auction to the uh, to the main chain? What if uh, someone you know submit a new bid or something like that? So this kind of a thing is relatively hard on plasma because it requ requires uh, you to implement uh, a uh, EVM inside of a EVM effectively. And uh, uh, however, for for uh, uh, but but it's uh, I think it's definitely possible that uh, you know we just need to have some more more time to research and maybe change the uh, virtual machine construct. And uh, uh, for state channel, uh, things are a little bit uh, easier. For example, in Stellar, uh, what we can enable is actually not only just uh, for payment scalability. One key feature from Stellar is that we enable generalized state channel. That is, you can actually run. Uh, you know, uh, complex uh, smart contract also off chain. So the idea here is that for the smart contract state, you can have a uh, you know a virtual contract instantiated, and then uh, for each of the uh, state progress of the smart contract, you can just have all the participa uh, participating signing on that and validating the state is valid. So uh, that's kind of like the quick comparison here. Yeah. Um, so another thing uh, to just zoom out a bit from the technical details is. Uh, do you guys think that maybe layer two or layer one might speed up adoption in a sense? Uh, will they perhaps change the interfaces by which users interact with blockchains? Yeah, I mean, in one respect, latency is kind of a, if, if we're willing to classify latency as a, as a scalability thing, latency, it seems quite important. Um, quick transaction times are nice. You guys are all users, I'm sure, of something. And, you know, if it's quicker, it's better, just like, you know, usually. Um, and also in general, you know, if we build platforms that can support larger decentralized applications, people will be able to build larger decentralized applications, uh, hopefully helping adoption in some sense, if, if we decide we want to do that, I guess. I do think so that there are definitely some challenges that are unique, though, to, especially to layer two scaling solutions, where, um, like, for example, this requirement that you be online once a week to check something is not, there's no real analog. When we, people try to explain how this works, um, there's, there's not really a lot of analogies in terms of like user experience where someone like has to go check something every once in a while or just like, or through, through no other fault of theirs other than just being offline for a week, like all their money has gone. <laughs> like that's, that's, that's not a normal sort of payment experience. And so much like I think storing private keys or um, uh, sort of like dealing with privacy coins, like those are maybe new user habits that we either have to build tools that make it easier to do or, um, or educate users to, to do that. Although again, I think, I think ultimately it is gonna come down to like, p users shouldn't have to think about this. So there should be solutions like watchtowers or other things to try to kind of abstract this away so that you don't actually have to worry about, oh man, you know, oh, how long have I been offline? Um, you know, is, is all my, like, literally all my money gonna be, gonna be gone when I, when I get back on? 
Yeah, that's uh, that's that's a great point, and uh, you know, I, I think you you hit on very very good point that is like the onboarding process of all these, including like layer two solutions, that is going to be super critical, right? So, uh, but I think layer two solutions is definitely going to help in terms of adoption. Uh, you know, how many of you guys have tried out like the the application that we build using layer two at our booth? Okay, a bunch, yeah. That's pretty good. So that kind of like uh, uh, application, th so what we build is a board game, right? So if, uh, if Alice and Bob come to blockchain and they play a chess, then what happens is that Alice will make a move. <laughs> yeah. Now, now we are all just waiting for the block confirmation time. <laughs> Right, so that's kind of the user experience if we build a block uh, uh, application on a layer one blockchain. But if you do it as on a layer two uh, uh, solution, like uh, uh, like the off-chain smart contract, you can do like Alice makes move, Bob makes move, Alex makes move, Bob makes move. If you haven't tried, it, like uh, find me after the panel, and I, I will show you how this uh, th this works basically. Why 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 do you want to play chess on the blockchain? <laughs> Great question. So why do we want to play chess on the blockchain? You absolutely don't want to play chess on the blockchain if there's no money at stake. Why, why do we, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so basically, this kind of, uh, th of smart, off-chain smart contract uh, construct, what, what this is really powerful about it is it enables this kind of a, what we would call a conditional payment. Right, so you have Alice and Bob, they go onto blockchain and play some game. The first thing they do is Alice send Bob a conditional payment, a multi-hop cross-network conditional payment, saying that I'm paying you $0.1, but uh, it, the payment is depending on you actually finally win the game. And uh, Bob will pay the same thing to Alice. So now Alice and Bob doesn't have to know each other. So Mo, I'm going to I'm gonna interrupt because uh, yeah. it might be going a little too into the details. All right. but, so, um, but yeah, you, you got you yeah, it just. Right. I, mean, yeah. Yeah, but I, I do think I generally agree maybe with Evan on um, sort of as far as applications that like the, you know, the killer applications so far generally that we've seen are um, tokenization, um, exchange, and payments. Right on blockchains yeah. in general, and so yes, it, I, I do think it, it does enable a lot of really other cool things. But like, there is a lot of design space there, maybe that is yet to be explored, and the experience that is that hasn't been improved um, sufficiently. And so, uh, just improving on improving latency for that, and this is why I think a lot of like I think Plasma um, getting doing Plasma for more complicated things can be really challenging. But really, um, if you sort of limit your scope and just say I'm building this for payments, I'm building this for exchange, I'm building this for tokenization, um, you can. Scale that experience a lot without without really um, necessarily having to get into more into sort of the more complex stuff, which I think which I do really like, and I think generally yes, like decentralized gambling is very cool. But um, as far as sort of like the the um, where I think I see that you see the pain points most right now often is in is in pay, uh, payments. Um, real quick, <clears throat> this is kind of a side point, but uh, I'm gonna. So it seems like you're quite pro layer two scalability in some sense. It seems like it's a uh, you know no, a, I'm pro both. I'm yeah, pro both. Pro both sure. Yeah. Um, uh, which includes pro layer two, but um, <laughs> uh, by the way, is anyone here like anti layer one by by chance in in terms of uh, like is it not like realistic or <laughs> <laughs> hopefully no? Uh, <laughs> yeah, so I guess I guess here's my question to you: um, building these things, it seems like this is a kind of a major part of the Teller protocol. Are you at all worried um, that the you know the miners in your protocol um, are maybe not as nice as you are assuming them to be, and that maybe they just might censor transactions for users and steal money from users because all of their money is seemingly going to be locked up in these payment channels? So the uh, so first of all the money uh, so uh, about like miner censorship. Uh, censorship happens on all sorts of decentralized systems. Uh, uh, you know, uh, it happens even more uh, likely in a centralized mining scenario, like if you were, you were talking about the blockchain, layer one blockchains. Uh, for layer two blockchains, it's uh, even easier to, uh, to make it an open network, right? So you can, it, it's still a decentralized system. It's not like a, a single hub that is dominating this entire uh, payment or generalized state channel network. You can, uh, so what we envision is that uh, there will be an off-chain service provider pop up, popping up and there will be a decentralized network off-chain service provider. And just like you choose uh, Xfinity or at and you can choose different kind of off-chain service providers. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. So, so more specifically, my mm -hmm. concern is: imagine that the miners on chain yeah. specifically are, you know, we kind of see them in general being more centralized, maybe than we'd like them to in most major blockchains. Imagine they start censoring the settlement transactions of these state channels. So, specifically, what I'm referring to is. We've talked about how state channels require this interactivity period, right? You have to be online and watching to make sure that your funds aren't stolen, okay? Now, my question essentially is, is what happens if the miners, I don't know, because maybe they're not the nicest people in the world all the time, decide to go into cahoots with some users and essentially censor these settlement transactions and essentially 
the miners in cahoots with users steal money from people. Are you at all concerned about this? Um, and, and do you have any like suggested solutions to this problem at all? So I think uh, you know this is a this is a general problem for uh, censoring ship on uh, la base layer blockchain. Uh, so for the for the smart contract portion of layer two solutions, it's just another smart contract. It has some logic that may uh, be infected by the censorship, and it's just so as every other blockchain uh, smart contract. So yes, so I think that's a general uh, general problem of the censorship of like the base layer protocol, and in particular uh, for state channel solutions, yes, uh, it may be affected by the layer one censorship definitely. Uh, so as any other smart contracts. So so um, I would push back a bit in that, n like notably the difference is that. Um, in a chess game online, uh, like let's imagine every single move is submitted to the blockchain, the game's not going to terminate, um, you know, unless we build that logic in on chain um, um, in the same kind of way. Although if you did have a timer, it might be. But my point is in general, like in, for example, payments, let's talk about like we have been. Um, if I have my money on a blockchain, miners can't take it from me, whether or not they censor my transactions for the next 150 years, right? It's still going to be mined at the end of that as long as I maintain control of my private key. And that's something that's notably not true um, with state channels. Oh, no, that is absolutely true, right? So, you know, you deposit it into the state channel, that money still belongs to you. Um, it, you need to have like a, 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 a basically uh, a process of a settlement uh, to get the money back. Uh, but th that money, no one is uh, taking that yeah, money but away. But, but, but if, if miners steal, uh, censor the base chain for like a few days or whatever your timeout period sure. is, you c they can cause your channel to be, out to be exited in an outdated state, right? Uh, so, okay, so yes, yes, that, that's the part that mi minor censorship can hurt layer two, in, in this case specifically a payment channel contract, but there are um, many other cases, let's say, you, you know, if you're doing auction, you're doing like a claiming of your NFT, to NFT token, your crypto kitty is locked up somewhere, all these things can be done with this kind of like censorship. Uh, so it's not to say that this is like a, a unique problem of layer two solution, but it, it's a, a censorship itself is a problem. Yeah, right, right. Like that, that seems like your problem, Nate. Like <laughs> what you were supposed to give us a solid layer one blockchain and instead you gave us an amorphous, I don't know if it's a tree or what, <laughs> design for sharding before solving the censorship problem that was supposed to be your problem. Yeah, fair point, fair point. I think, um, yeah. <laughs> You're right. It's, it's on us. Um, yeah, no. So I think, I think you're totally right in that there are a lot of things that we could do on the blockchain that would be affected by minor censorship. And I think it's an incredibly important problem because, you know, miners probably actually aren't that nice. And so we should definitely be very wary of these problems when we're building applications, right? And, and so, in general, as protocol designers and as application designers, I think it's our duty to make sure that we, we, we Consider the worst case scenarios, right? And, and I guess the point that I'm making is that in many cases, we can build things on first layer scalability solutions that aren't vulnerable to these things like minor censorship, whereas if we build them in second layer scaling solutions, they are. While I agree with you that there are, there are things on first layer solutions that are vulnerable to censorship, and I don't know if we'll ever be able to fix censorship, second layer solutions certainly always are. And that's why I'm hesitant. OK, to so let me just uh, you know, go into the weeds a little bit here. Uh, so, so if you, uh, you know, for the, for the settlement problem specifically, right? So zero knowledge proof can actually solve this because miner can, miner, it's, it's gonna be hard for miner to tell that even like which channel you're settling, for example, right? So if, if you build like zero knowledge proof uh, settlement process into this, then, you know, the, it, it in, uh, unless the miner just massively censor like uh, all sorts of, uh, you know, channel, channel settlement transaction, it's very even hard for the miner to tell like which, which channel uh, you're settling until he processes the transaction and then you later on prove that, uh, hey, look, you, I've already, uh, you know, settled this channel in an earlier block. So you're absolutely right that for layer two protocol designers, these kind of uh, things is something that we should definitely think about. That is to make the layer two protocol and the associated smart contract more more censorship resistant. Uh, but yeah, it's a general problem, basically. One thing I'd like to get to before we're out of time is uh, how does interoperability sort of come into the mix of this uh, layer, layer two and layer one? Lead a bit of a leading question. So um, <laughs> I, I, I think a lot about interoperability. Work on Interledger, it's about making payments happen across different blockchains, different layer two solutions. And so um, I can, you know, talk for days about why I think interoperability is so important. But in one, of, one of the aspects is just about user choice and making it so that we can continue to innovate on different underlying technologies while building applications on top that are actually agnostic to what we're using. So 
The reason why it's so easy to build things on top of the internet is because it doesn't care what kind of underlying networking technology we're using. I think there's a similar parallel where we want to be able to build applications on top of this sort of blockchain stack without, digging, without being super tied to the specific underlying technology we're using. That said, like, that's a kind of side note, but I think in general one of the big aspects with interoperability is that will really improve the user experience of these things. Because today the user experience is, oh, I have this great new blockchain, I'm using a really awesome layer two solution, or maybe not, on top of it, can I send you money? And the answer is no, because you almost definitely are not using that same network, and so the user experience kind of stops there. So I think being able to connect these up is very important. While we've been working on that, we've looked at a lot, we've been connecting a lot of different types of solutions and found pros and cons amongst payment channels, uh, kind of off chain, like side chains and things like that. So could go into that more, but I think we're gonna run out of time soon, so. Another thing I was sort of wondering is, uh, does interoperability somewhat imply uh, scalability? Yes, I, I do think um, that they're, that they're it, you often need scalability in order to get really effective interoperability. And so, for example, with Interledger, um, the way that Interledger currently works requires a lot of really small payments. You have to sort of packetize payments into small amounts. And if you don't have really, and very fast ones too, and if you don't have high latency, uh, low latency and, um, and really cheap payments, you sort of can't have these chains interoperate in this particular way. And the same is true of a lot of other ways of doing cross-chain interoperability, um, where just it's, they're just too expensive to do if you're, if you're doing them on the base layer. So I do think um, you know, trying to solve that problem of, like, of uh, scaling often, um, of, of interoperability often first requires solving a scaling problem. Another thing I'll say is interoperability can give you a kind of scaling where, for example, the Lightning Network is really, when people talk about it as, a, as like a single scaling solution, it's really a integrated scaling solution, which is payment channels, and on top of that, an interoperability solution, which is this, these multi-hop um, payments across multiple payment channels. And that's, you know, that, that's a, uh, um, what it gives you is, oh, now I can send Bitcoin to anybody who is on the Lightning Network, ideally, if I'm, if I'm connected to them. But um, really, sort of the way that worked is we've got two separate ledgers, and we're, giving, we're providing some interoperability between them. I think the, the, another way to answer that question is also splitting up what we're doing by sort of use case all, is also a, a kind of way of, of adding more scalability if you look at the space as a whole. It doesn't solve the individual scaling problem of how do we solve an individual ledger, but if we, do, if we don't try to have one ledger for absolutely everything that everyone is doing in the world and instead have a little more purpose-built systems, that's another way of kind of breaking up the space. Uh, just to just to push back a bit, um, I think that so again we're going to be talking about trade-offs in terms of decentralization and security kind of on the margins here. But I would argue that um, lots of small application-specific blockchains might be getting too close to not very much security, a lot of scalability, uh, in the sense that if we just kind of naively split up into lots of little blockchains that aren't kind of sharing a validator set in some sense or sharing a security pool, then we might get ourselves into a situation where each little blockchain by itself is very insecure and easy to attack. Um. And also, yeah, I mean, and I, well, I actually generally am kind of um, bullish on the idea of application-specific uh, blockchains or plasma chains. Um, it is, in sort of the history of computing, we ended up not with a lot of purpose-built hardware that's designed for like this specific application or this specific application. You just have sort of like more or less, you know, one sort of like platform computers that are fast enough that you can build sort of and simulate anything else on top of it. And so I guess that's maybe the case for something like sharding where you sort of have this uh, application agnostic um, set of shards. Yeah. So, sorry. Go for it. So yeah, yeah. I think I think that's uh, that's definitely a good point. Uh, just like uh, uh, another two cents into this discussion is that basically uh, interoperability again is a, a little bit loaded word, uh, and uh, you know I, I might, uh, I'm I'm not so familiar with the use cases of interoperability, but I do want to like uh, highlight one thing that we are pushing for for the uh, you know layer two scalability solutions that is a blockchain ag agnostic, right? So basically, platform agnostic uh, is something that we might uh, all want to think about because uh, you know uh, in any technical stack, once there's like a layered technical stack, once the interface uh, is uh, well defined. Uh, each layer can innovate independently. So that's uh, uh, you know, why we think uh, for this kind of interoperability discussion, we should always think about like blockchain agnostic uh, into this, basically. Yeah, so uh, this morning I was working on a blog post called Layer 3 is for Interoperability and making this exact point that you, if you want interoperability, 
you need to start with a blockchain agnostic design and not tie into specific uh, features of the blockchain. That said, I think there's an important point where I think layer two solutions actually should tie into very specific features of layer one because they should basically use every bit of capability that the underlying system gives them in order to add scalability. But I think that's why you need a separate layer focused on interoperability and abstracting the differences away in order to make that work. Yeah, absolutely. We're out of time, but uh, thank you guys for participating in this panel and thank you guys for listening. Thanks. Thanks.